Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series where today we're covering something a little bit lighter, or at least this is a mystery with no death, no missing people, no unidentified people, but it is still possibly one of the biggest mysteries of the modern age. This is the Gardner Museum heist in which 13 works of art were stolen, collectively valued at $500 million. Yes, you heard that right. Amongst the artworks stolen were three original Rembrandts and a Vermeer, none of which which have surfaced in almost 33 years since the heist. This is one of the most famous and long-standing art heist investigations. But before we get into the episode, I want to just take a moment to talk about our sponsor today, Blinkist. You all know how one of the most important things to me is education, sharing knowledge, it's why I do what I do here on my channel, which makes Blinkist the perfect sponsor. Blinkist is an app with bite-sized content that allows you to learn the most important points from over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in around 15 minutes. If you're someone who's strapped for time, who wants to keep up with the latest books but just doesn't have the spare time, maybe if you lack the attention span to read or listen to a whole book, Blinkist is perfect for you. It allows you to fit the key points of popular books in and around your busy lifestyle so you never have to feel like you're missing out. My drive to the stables every morning to do my horse is around 15 to 20 minutes and I've been loving listening to Blinks on those journeys, but you can read them as well if that's more your style. Of course, because I'm me, I've been working my way through the LGBTQIA plus icons and activists category and I was very happy to see Roxane Gay's Bad Feminist in there, which is a book I've been meaning to read forever, but honestly, I found it a bit intimidating. The second Blink about how reality TV dehumanises women was like a light bulb going off for me. How especially in reality dating shows, the women are treated as objects purely for a man's desire, ignoring the wisdom and depth that these women have to add to the narrative. Honestly, it was mind-blowing. Blinkist have also now introduced Blinkist Connect, which allows every premium plan to be shared by two different accounts at no additional cost. So you'll have one plan, but two separate accounts, so you can share only what you want, when you want, making you able to recommend titles and share all your favourites with your favourite person. One of my main goals for 2023 is to consume more non-fiction. I want to learn more about these topics, feminism and queer history that I'm so passionate about. That's who I want to become in 2023 and Blinkist is going to help me get there. You can get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your free seven day trial today by heading to the URL in the top line of the description box down below. Isabella Stewart Gardner was born in April 1840 and she became one of America's leading art collectors, philanthropists and patrons of the arts. She was said to have a deep love of travel and had this intellectual curiosity whilst also generally being considered very eccentric. Isabella would cause a stir wherever she went. Her name was a common occurrence in the gossip columns of this time. Throughout the late 19th century, Isabella and her husband Jack travelled the world, falling in love with art from around the globe and starting their art collection. It was in Europe they acquired the most pieces, one of their very first purchases being the concert by Vermeer which they got at auction. From there, the Gardner's art collection would almost grow out of control. They collected everything from paintings to sculptures to tapestries and more. Eventually, their art collection got so big, it outgrew their already very large house in Boston, and then after Jack suddenly died in 1898, Isabella decided to see through their joint dream of building a museum for their collection, so it could be appreciated and admired by others, as art is supposed to be. And from there, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was born, carefully curated and styled by herself, while she lived on the fourth floor of the building. The museum opened to the public on the 1st of January 1903 and remains open to this very day, although of course Isabella herself passed away long ago, aged 84. Her legacy remains within these walls though, although 13 items smaller than it used to be. It was stipulated upon her death that the artwork in the museum should never be altered. There would never be any items sold or bought into the collection. It was intended to stay exactly as Isabella curated. And she did leave a $3.6 million endowment to the museum, but that money only went so far. By the 1980s, the museum was running out of money and was falling into disrepair. It lacked any climate control, which is very important when you're dealing with art. It needed loads of maintenance and even lacked an insurance policy. 
In 1982, the FBI did uncover a plot by local criminals to rob a museum, so funds were found put towards security. There were infrared motion detectors and a CCTV system was put around the outside of the building, but there was nothing inside. This definitely was an upgrade on what they had before, but it was still rather lax. For example, the only button that could be pressed to immediately contact the police was located at the open security desk. They did hire more security guards, but there was no sort of locked room with a guard overseeing the whole museum. Museum. They just kind of sat at the aforementioned open desk. If there was no one sat at this security desk, this button couldn't be pressed. In 1988, an independent security company looked at the security system and said that whilst they were on par with most of the museums, there was definitely improvements that could be made. Basically, if somebody did decide to rob the garden museum, they were screwed. The museum was simply a sitting duck and the lack of security was well known by all the employees, particularly by the security guards who were only paid just above minimum wage. And then in the early hours of the 18th of March, 1990, St. Patrick's Day, these fears came into fruition. That night, there were two young guards on duty, 25-year-old Randy Heston and 23-year-old Rick Abbott. Rick was a self-described hippie and a member of a rock band. After dropping out of the Berklee School of Music, he started working nights in the museum just to earn a bit of money. It wasn't exactly a job he was passionate about or even really liked, and this was a fact that he did make well known. It was simply a job to pay the bills, and this was actually one of his very last shifts after handing in his notice. It's also said that Rick would often turn up to work high or drunk, so it didn't look really great for him when this heist happened whilst he was on duty, although he does insist that he was completely sober on the night in question. Whilst most people across the city were out drinking, celebrating St. Patrick's Day, Rick and Randy were keeping a watch on the museum, taking turns to patrol the building after arriving for their shift at 11.30pm. Now, as I mentioned before, the Gardner Museum didn't have security cameras inside, only on the perimeter of the building, but they did have motion detectors that did record Rick's movements that night as he made his rounds. He finished his patrol at around 1am before returning back to the security desk and switching with Randy. Now, being a security guard or a night watchman is a pretty boring job. Your entire role is basically to ensure that nothing happens. It's a lot of just sitting alone with your thoughts and hoping that an alarm doesn't go off anywhere. And that night was quite an eventful one because just before Rick finished his patrol at 1am, an alarm had indeed gone off. It was a fire alarm on the third floor. He looked around for any sign of fire or smoke, but instead just found one room where the strobes from the security systems were going mad, but there was no actual fire. He just assumed it simply malfunctioned, so went to the control panel to turn it off, and then he returned back to his security desk. He thought that was about as exciting as his night was going to get. Turns out he was wrong. At around 1.20am, the buzzer went off, and Rick was connected to two men on the other side of the side entrance door who claimed to be police officers. They said that they were there investigating a disturbance, and Rick, probably thinking of the fire alarm half an hour earlier, or the fact that it was St. Patrick's Day and maybe a rowdy party and might have climbed over the fence, buzzed them in at 1.24am. He said he felt compelled to let them inside because they were police officers wearing the full uniforms, which would later be determined to have been stolen. So the guard's instructions was to never let anyone in the building overnight, but neither guard had ever been told what to do if the police turned up. I think most people probably would let the police in, especially if they looked legit, as they did here. The director of security at the time, Lyle W. Grindle, refuted this and did say that all guards who worked the night shift were told never to admit police officers who they hadn't summoned directly. Apparently it was written in the museum security manual that was kept at the desk, but neither of the guards seemed to be aware of this. Maybe that's a possible training issue there. You really can't rely on people to read manuals, even if it is their job. Once they'd entered, the two men asked Rick if there were any other security guards in the building, to which he said yes, there was one other on patrol doing rounds on the third floor. The police officer said, get him down here. Just one of the men apparently did all the talking, whilst the other remained completely silent, so Rick radioed Randy to come down. It was around this time that Rick started to realise that something was off, as one of the moustaches the men was wearing was clearly fake. At that point, one of the men told Rick that he looked familiar. He thinks they have a default warrant out for his arrest and asked Rick to step away from the desk so they can run some checks. And this was the critical error because as you may remember, the only button they had to immediately alert the police was located behind this desk. And it seems like the criminals here knew that, asking Rick to step away. 
This was something that had come up in the independent security company's review a couple of years beforehand. The museum knew that this was a weak point in their system. And even just one year beforehand, the museum security specialist had come in and urged the gardener to move the entire security operation, including the alarm button, into a secure control room that was only accessible with a pass key. Just two months before this robbery, the museum had put forward renovation plans that took this recommendation into consideration. This was something that was probably gonna happen in the very near future. So it seems like the criminals here knew that. They knew that this was a case of now or never. If they wanted to conduct a heist, they had to do it now. The two police officers instructed Rick to stand spread eagle facing the wall and then before he knew it, he was being handcuffed. He would later say, then it hit me, they hadn't frisked me. I'd never been arrested, but I'd watched enough cop shows to know that they always frisk people before they arrest them. If it wasn't an arrest, then it had to be a robbery. Around this same time, Randy arrived back at the security desk and they immediately put him in handcuffs as well. He asked why he was being arrested, to which he was told, you're not being arrested, this is a robbery. Don't give us any problems and you won't get hurt. It said that to this, Rick responded that they didn't need to worry about that, he wasn't paid enough to get hurt. One of the thieves then said that if they don't tell the police anything about them for a whole year, they'll send them a reward. Within just a matter of minutes from there, the guards had their hands, feet and heads wrapped in duct tape before they were led down to the basement and taped to posts about 100 feet apart. This whole process from entering to tying them up took about 24 minutes, meaning that by 1.48am the thieves had free run of the museum, knowing they could take their time and there was no one around to press the police alert button, even if they did trip an alarm. Which they did just three minutes after leaving the basement in the stair hallway. And then they got to work, ransacking the museum as their steps were traced by the museum's motion detector system. The thieves immediately headed up to the second floor where they split up, with one heading to the Dutch room at the south end of the building and the other to the short gallery on the opposite side. As with most big museums, each room was given a name according to the work you'd find inside. From the short gallery, six pieces were stolen, four by Degas, who was a French Impressionist artist most known for his pastel drawings and oil paintings, and then, quite randomly, a gilded eagle finial atop a Napoleonic banner. It seems like the thieves had actually tried to remove this entire banner which hung above the entry to the tapestry room, but it was held in place by lots of tiny little screws, so it was very difficult, more difficult than it was worth. Instead, investigators suspected that they swiped the eagle as that was very easily removed, as maybe some kind of trophy piece. They might have thought it was gold, but it was in fact only bronze. Six items were also taken from the Dutch room, a Vermeer oil painting and three Rembrandts, which were two oil paintings and one self-portrait. Now, I don't claim to be particularly knowledgeable about the art world, I actually know nothing about art, but even I know Vermeer and Rembrandt. Each of these oil paintings were thought to be able to collect at least $15 million in today's market. Everything does have a price, but honestly, they were kind of considered to be priceless. As the thieves approached these very valuable paintings in the Dutch room, an alarm would have sounded, but the thieves simply smashed the alarm. It didn't matter, they knew no one was round to alert the police. Alongside those pieces, a Govert Flink oil painting was taken and a Chinese bronze beaker known as Q from the Shang Dynasty. As well as that, at some point in all of this, another oil painting by Edouard Manet was stolen from the blue room on the first floor, but they've never been able to figure out exactly when that was taken because no motion alarms went off in there. In fact, the last time anyone seemed to have been in the blue room was Rick Abbott, the security guard, when he was on his patrol. At 2.27am, the thieves returned to the Dutch room for a final time and entered the hallway before making their exit, and this was just 64 minutes after they'd entered the building. Now, before making their departure, the thieves made two checks on the guards in the basement to ensure that they were still there, before removing the videotape from the recorder that would have captured their images at the side door. They also took the computer printout from the motion detector equipment, probably not realising that all of that information was stored on the computer's hard drive. At 2.41am, they started to make their escape with their haul, and it's thought that the thieves may have exited separately within minutes of each other, making their escapes never to be found. The guards tied up down in the basement didn't hear the thieves leave, and they would remain stuck to the post until the next morning. Rick said that at first he was very concerned the thieves were going to burn the entire building down, but once he realised that wasn't going to happen, he just relaxed and waited it out. 
The day shift of guards arrived the next morning, I think around just before 8am, and realised pretty quickly that something was up. They had to be let in by the night guards and nobody was answering the door, nor could they establish any form of contact with them. So they called the security director who let them in. And when they found no one at the security desk, they called the police who eventually found Rick and Randy in the basement. What followed was one of the biggest art heist investigations ever conducted, an investigation that's still ongoing to this day. Seeing as it was highly likely that these stolen artworks were gonna be crossing state lines, the FBI took immediate control of this case as that would be under their jurisdiction. But it was baffling for investigators from very early on because there was just no physical evidence at all in this case. There were no footprints, not a single hair, and there were fingerprints, but it's not known if they were from the thieves or museum employees or museum guests. It was also very interesting that it was clear that the thieves took very little care of the paintings they were stealing, with them being literally ripped out of their frames, cut through, and likely destroyed in the process. They didn't take the time to carefully take them out of the frames. In stealing two of the paintings, they would have had to have thrown them on the ground with quite some force to smash their glass protective casing. There was very little care taken here. These certainly weren't people who valued art. And perhaps that's further encapsulated in the fact that they left possibly the most expensive piece in the museum untouched, Titian's The Rape of Europa, which was hanging in a gallery on the third floor. There were also pieces of work by Michelangelo and Raphael that remained untouched. These thieves had all the time in the world, or at least until the early morning when the day shift arrived to take over. Why did they only take 13 pieces? Why didn't they take much more? Why didn't they take the most valuable pieces? It's said that most art heists happen in less than three minutes. These thieves get in and out. These thieves knew they had more time than that, so why didn't they make the most of it? The small Manet taken from the downstairs gallery has always been one of the most confusing points in this heist. This was a tiny painting, only 10 by 13 inches, and it was cut from its frame. And the frame was then left on a chair in the security director's office. Why would this frame be left there? Why did no motion detector go off? Why bother going into that room when the big money stuff was all upstairs? As is always the case with unsolved crimes, there are just way more questions here than answers. Now, a lot of people do think that these thieves weren't stealing the artwork for themselves, and instead they were working for somebody higher up. Maybe this person made specific requests of what items they wanted. But if they had specific requests, why wouldn't it be the more expensive pieces? So on the other hand, that might suggest that they weren't given a list. The obvious suspect here has always been some kind of organised crime syndicate, likely the Mafia, but we'll look more closely at theories and suspects in a little bit. The first stop in the FBI's investigation was obviously to question the guards, the only people who got a solid look at the thieves' faces. The thieves weren't wearing masks or anything, one was just wearing a bad excuse of a fake moustache, but that was about it. They went to no lengths to cover their faces. Rick Abbott was able to provide quite a generic description of the thieves. He said one was in his late 30s, about 5 foot 9, slim with gold wire glasses and a moustache. The other was in his early 30s, 6 foot and heavier with chubby cheeks and another moustache. He worked with police to draw composite sketches of these suspects, but in his own words, it was awful. I'm not sure if the bad composite sketch was the result of bad memory or a bad artist or perhaps a combination of both. I must admit that it does always amaze me when criminals do end up looking like their composite sketches because I don't think that I personally could do an adequate job of describing anyone's facial features, even the people who are closest to me. But I do suppose that's why you've got to have good artists. Years later, in 2005, Rick would say to the Boston Globe, one of them looked like Colonel Klink on Hogan's Heroes. That's all I can remember. In terms of the actual investigation, there honestly wasn't loads to be done here. The FBI spoke to the guards, got the description, a forensic sweep revealed nothing, and that was kind of where the path ended. As years have gone on and technology improved, the FBI have done some DNA analysis, but nothing has provided any answers yet. The museum didn't have an insurance policy at this time and their funds were incredibly low, so they didn't have the money themselves to offer reward money for the return of the paintings. Instead, within just three days, they teamed up with famous auction houses Sotheby's and Christie's to post a reward of $1 million for the return of the paintings. In 1997, this was increased to 5 million and then 20 years later in 2017, this was doubled to 10 million. Most sources say that this reward was given an expiration date of the end of the year, of the end of 2017, but according to the Garden Museum website, that reward does still stand today for the recovery of all the stolen works. 
A portion of this would be given in exchange for information leading to the return of any of the works, and a separate reward of $100,000 stands for the Napoleonic Eagle Finial. It's said that anyone with any information about the stolen artwork should contact the Gardner Museum directly and confidentiality would be ensured. You see, the Statute of Limitations on this theft ran out in 1995, and that means that even if they did identify the thieves today, they wouldn't be able to prosecute. So they've said that all they want is the artworks back, with no threat involved. But still, any leads that have come in from the public just lead to dead ends. People want the money, but nobody actually knows anything. In late April 1994, the museum received what was possibly the only helpful lead ever in this case. It was a letter from an anonymous person saying that he would be able to facilitate the return of the paintings in exchange for $2.6 million and full immunity from prosecution. Obviously, the museum turned this letter, which was postmarked in New York State, over to the FBI. Now, I am sure that the museum and the FBI receive a lot of letters and phone calls over the years from people claiming to know information about this case, people just in search of the reward money. But the author of this letter showed considerable knowledge of the paintings and of the art world as a whole, details that not just anyone would know. He said the paintings were being stored in archival conditions and had not yet been sold, but the museum had to act very quickly because the paintings were being held in a country where a buyer who was oblivious to the fact they'd been stolen would be able to claim legal ownership and not have to hand them back. In the letter, the writer had even come up with a plan as to how the museum could communicate with them because obviously they couldn't just give a return address. If the museum were open to negotiating this ransom deal, they had to send a signal by arranging to have the number one inserted into the foreign dollar exchange listing for the Italian lira that would be published in the Boston Sunday Globe on May 1st, 1994. And that is exactly what the museum did. The editor of the Globe at the time agreed to insert the number in a way that didn't make the currency listing itself inaccurate. And they placed the number one just a few spaces in front of the actual exchange rate for the lira. The next week, the museum received a second letter from the same writer, who had of course seen the message in the newspaper. But he wasn't happy, he was actually furious that the federal, state and local law enforcement had all got involved. He wrote, Are the museum and authorities interested in getting the paintings returned, or in arresting a low-level intermediary? Then in all capital letters, you cannot have both. The letter writer said that he had to think about whether they were going to be able to ensure confidentiality here and that if he decided that that was impossible, he would instead just provide the museum with clues as to where the paintings were. But instead, he just never wrote the museum again. Was this legit? Honestly, there's no way of knowing for sure, but I can only assume that there were details included in the letter, maybe details of the heist that nobody else could have known, that caused the authorities to pay attention because they did really pay attention to this. I think they thought it was real. Now, some might call me ignorant, but big art heists such as this one have always baffled me. If you're stealing some of the most expensive and unique paintings in the world from these big revered artists and taking such a risk to do so, you're not exactly going to get home and hang it in your hallway for people to admire. Anyone who does appreciate the artwork for what it is is likely going to know it's stolen and then you're screwed. So it stands to reason that these pieces are sold on the black market for a lot of money, but my point still stands. These people buying the items on the black market can't exactly display them either. Is just the knowledge that they own these paintings enough? Well, of course, being me, I did some research into this and some people on the internet had some fascinating insights. Apparently for some people, when they steal art like the pieces that were stolen at the Gardner Museum, you don't do so with the intention of stealing it. You do so for the knowledge that you own it, for your own private collection. Some people are just collectors, it doesn't need to be displayed, just knowing for yourself is enough. For others, especially for more seasoned criminals and gang leaders, it's not about the artwork itself. It's about being able to boost your reputation within your network, which could present other opportunities. After all, if you're able to pull off a heist like the Gardener one, what else can you do? It's a pin on your chest, it's like, look what a good criminal I am. And a lot of the time, whilst these things would be common knowledge within gangs and crime rings, it's rarely going to leave that circle. Another reason is that valuable art pieces can also be used as bargaining chips, with an article I read on theartnewspaper.com by Rhea Pryor saying that they can be used to reduce sentences if they're caught for further crimes. Artwork can also be used as collateral in other crimes, future deals with other crime rings. Whereas Robert Whitman with the FBI's art crime team told NBC News that the true art in art theft is not in the stealing, it's in the selling. 
when you steal a world famous painting, it becomes difficult to fence. So that's when the true skill comes in, finding the right buyer. There was quite a big case from around 2016 when the Kimura crime clan based out of Naples were found to have two incredibly valuable paintings, 14 years after they'd been stolen from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam in 2002. Whitman said that the reason these paintings were found was because they couldn't be sold, the clan were trying to market them again and that's when the authorities pounced. All in all, it's considered that art thievery is a very short-sighted crime. People think they can make a lot of money by stealing valuable painting, but then it hits the media and they can't sell it. But in a lot of other cases, it can be the other way around. Somebody wants a painting for a collection and they hire a crime ring to steal it. And that's what a lot of people do think happened with the Gardner Museum heist, seeing as these criminals clearly had very little understanding of the true value of these items. Back in 2016, Anthony Amore, the current director of security at the Garden Museum and the author of the book, The Art of the Con, said that he's convinced that the former is what happened at Gardner and that's why the items have never been found. He said, my best guess is they're being held by somebody who can't figure out how to monetize them. We're offering a $5 million reward for the paintings. So as far as the thieves are concerned, we're the only game in town, but that means coming forward. I do question though that if the statute of limitations is now up and thieves can no longer be held accountable for their crime, why wouldn't they come forward with the paintings for this big payday? That to me suggests they don't have them anymore or they just don't want to be identified. But the museum has said that their confidentiality is ensured, so who knows? And Moore's even said that they don't even have to physically hand over the paintings to be eligible for the reward, they just want to be able to recover them in any way they can. At the end of the day, if you want to commit a crime for a big payday, art theft probably isn't the way forward. Which I think brings us onto the theories or suspects portion of this video, and we do have FBI suspects here. In March 2013, on the 23rd anniversary of the heist, the FBI announced in a statement that they believe they had positively identified the two thieves, saying, the FBI believes with a high degree of confidence in the years after the theft that art was transported to Connecticut and the Philadelphia region, and some of the art was taken to Philadelphia where it was offered for sale by those responsible for the theft. With that same confidence, we have identified the thieves who are members of a criminal organisation with a base in the mid-Atlantic states and New England. However, they say that after that point, their knowledge of the art's whereabouts is limited. And although they don't know where the art is currently located, with this announcement, they hope to widen the aperture of awareness of this crime to reach the American public and others around the world. And then two years later in 2015, the sources say that the FBI actually revealed more information about the possible suspects. Now, I don't think the FBI actually released their names. Some sources say they did, but I couldn't find the original statement. Regardless, it's widely reported that these may have been George Reisfelder and Leonard DiMuzio, two associates of the late mobster Camelo Molino, who was closely associated with the Boston area New England Mafia. Both Reisfelder and DiMuzio died within just one year of the heist, with Molino dying in 2005 in prison. So who was Carmelo Molino? He was probably what a lot of us think when we think of that sort of stereotypical mafia leader. He was a family man, he would do anything for those closest to him, but he had a mean streak and would do anything to make money. In 1968, he was convicted of robbing an armoured truck of $542,000 and was given a very lengthy prison sentence before being released in the 80s. After this, he opened up a car repair shop in Dorchester, which was called TRC Auto Electric, but that of course was just a front for a $1 million a year cocaine trafficking business. He'd be arrested for that in 1992, but upon his arrest, he offered the FBI a deal. He had a portrait of George Washington from a 1985 heist at the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Museum in Portland, Maine, that he was willing to exchange for a shorter sentence. And this worked, knocked years of his prison time, and he was released shortly after. And then seven years later, Molino and three associates were arrested again for conspiring to rob the Loomis Fargo vault in Easton, where millions of dollars was kept at this time. This time after his arrest, he didn't have a rare stolen painting to exchange for a shorter sentence, but this was a bit surprising to the FBI. They'd actually placed an undercover informant in Molino's business who taped his multiple discussions with associates about the Gardner paintings. The first thing the FBI told him upon his arrest was that all charges would be dropped against him if he could reveal the location of this stolen art. 
but none of them, not Molino or any of his associates, were able to, and as we know, Molino would end up dying in prison in 2005. He actually claimed that the FBI had set him up, thinking that he had the art, and he said at trial the government pulled a real fast one. Despite this, many people do still think that Molino had a hand in the heist, thinking that maybe he was hired by a higher up to mastermind it, and then he hired Reisfelder and Demuzio to actually carry it out. Demuzio certainly did resemble the composite sketches of at least one of the thieves. But the Molino gang ran deep, and they weren't the only criminals associated with the name. In 2010, the names of Robert Garenti and Robert Gentile were also implicated. Now, Garenti died of cancer all the way back in 2004, but in 2010, his widow, Hélène, told the FBI that at one point, he had owned some of the stolen paintings. Apparently, when he got diagnosed with cancer, he gave them to Gentile for safekeeping, but of course, Gentile denies these accusations. In 2012, he was arrested on drug charges, and it seems the FBI again hoped that he would exchange information for a lesser sentence, but he never did. Gentile did agree to a polygraph test, which did indicate he was lying when he said he didn't know anything about the artwork, but then he demanded a retest. Then he said that Elengarente had shown him the Rembrandt self-portrait one time, to which he was apparently telling the truth. But that was about all he said, so a few days later, the FBI searched his house. They found a secret ditch underneath a false floor in the garden shed, but this was empty. Gentile's son would say that a few years before this, the ditch had flooded and apparently his father was furious. In his basement, they found a newspaper article from the Boston Herald which reported the theft, along with how much each item might have been worth on the black market. But that was all they found, there was no sign of the actual paintings. Gentile ended up going to prison for 30 months on his drug charges after the FBI did find drugs and firearms in his house, but he never shared anything more about the paintings. He died in September 2021 and denied having the paintings until his death. Anthony Amore, the Gardner security director, said that he always believed that Gentile had some information that might have helped them. They think he had contact with at least two of the works, but now they'll never know. Hélène also died in 2018, taking any information she had to the grave as well, but the FBI do believe that she was a very credible witness. And then there was a man called Bobby Donati, who was another career criminal with gang affiliations who was known to be associated with other art thefts. When in 2013 the FBI alluded that thieves may now be dead, sleuths came across the name of Bobby Donati, and credibility began to grow that he could be involved along with two associates, Miles Connor and Vincent Ferreira. Connor would release a memoir in 2010 entitled The Art of the Heist, Confessions of a Master Thief, in which is detailed how the motive may well have been to get Connor and Ferreira out of jail, to exchange the stolen art for their freedoms. Miles Connor is kind of known for being one of the best known art thieves in the Boston area. He had been responsible for a number of robberies alongside Bobby Donati, and he'd previously used stolen artworks in exchange for freedom, so this was something that was common for him. So when Connor and Ferreira went to jail, Donati may have had the great idea of pulling off another heist for some valuable artwork. Ferreira would later say that Donati told him that he had plans to do this, and Ferreira told him not to because the charges against him were too serious to be dropped in such a way. But then the heist actually happened, and it's not known if Donati or anyone on his behalf ever contacted the authorities to do this negotiation. The FBI have never discussed the potential involvement of Donati publicly, and then he was killed in 1999 on the porch of his home and found in the boot of a Cadillac a few days later. His death was incredibly brutal, and to this day, nobody knows why he was killed, although it was likely something to do with his gang affiliations. It's thought that Donati does have a resemblance to the shorter of the two thieves that night, but when journalists reached out to his family, his sister said that she doubted he had the strategic prowess to pull off such a theft. However, a friend apparently remembered Donati showing up one day with a paper bag that contained two police uniforms. So take from that what you will. Donati was also a close friend of the aforementioned Robert Garente. But let's move on and talk about another gangster on a whole other level, Whitey Bulger. Now, I've spoken about Whitey Bulger before on my channel in connection with multiple unsolved murders. He was one of the most powerful crime bosses in Boston, heading the Winter Hill Gang, which was an Irish-American mob. In all honesty, there's not loads I have here to connect Bulger to this heist, but he definitely had the means to do it if he wanted to. Bulger was also famously an IRA sympathiser, he was involved in multiple arms deals and drug shipments from Boston to Ireland, and it's long been speculated that the paintings may have ended up in Ireland as well. 
Charles Hill, a former Scotland Yard detective who spent a lot of time looking at this case, says that he believes that after a shipment of weapons and ammunition was intercepted by the Irish Navy in 1984, Bulgy may have felt like he owed his friends in the Republic and offered them the paintings. It's not known how much of a hand Bulger had in the original heist, if he ordered it or not. But what we do know is that he was unbelievably powerful and people were scared of him. If he knew of the paintings, many experts believe that he would have muscled in and taken control of it shortly after. There's no actual evidence he was involved, like I said, other than the fact that he was who he was. Bulger spent 15 years as an informant to the FBI, leaking information about rival gangs in exchange for them turning a blind eye to his own crimes. But in 2011, he was finally arrested and charged with being complicit in 19 murders, racketeering, extortion and money laundering. He was convicted on all counts. There's no doubt that when he was arrested, he would have been questioned in regards to the garden heist, but it doesn't seem like he ever said anything, and according to Anthony Moore, he was never a person of interest. Which brings us, I think, onto our final person of interest in this case, and probably the one name you've all been screaming at the screen this entire time, the security guard, Rick Abbott. If you thought his actions were suspicious here, you are not the only one. He was actually investigated by the FBI very early on because of his suspicious behaviour on the night in question. He wasn't able to give a very good description of the thieves, even though he would have spent quite a bit of time looking them in the face. He was the last person in the blue room to set off the motion detector, and subsequent analysis found that the software wasn't faulty. It should have gone off when the thieves walked in there and stole the painting. Even more suspicion was cast upon him when the other guard, Randy, said that when Rick was on his patrol, he quickly opened and shut a side door, which some people believe might have been a signal to the thieves parked outside. However, Rick has said that he always did this to ensure the side door was locked. Now, Rick and Randy had never worked together before, so there was no way for Randy to know whether this was true or not, but another colleague said that if this was the case, the security printouts would have shown that he always did this. I don't know if they did or not. Was Rick working with the thieves to conduct this heist? Was it all planned? Lots of people do seem to agree that knowledge of the museum's poor security system should have remained within the museum, and therefore this must have been an inside job. At the very least, there was an informant on the inside. But then again, they'd had multiple consultants come in over the years and look at this system as well. Could it have been one of them to leak this information? In 2015, the FBI released some security footage from the night before the theft, which showed Rick buzzing in an unidentified man and having a chat with him at the security desk. He told investigators that he didn't recall the incident or recognise the man, which does sound suspicious, but reading between the lines, it doesn't sound like investigators spoke to him about this at the time, just years later. I might be wrong on that, but that's what I've been able to gather in my research. So, in 2015, the FBI released this footage to the public in the hope that somebody might be able to identify this person. And it just turned out this was a very disappointing lead. The man was simply Rick's boss, the museum's deputy security chief at this time. Another dead end. Rick has always maintained his innocence, and whilst his name will forever be entwined with the Garden Museum heist, the FBI have pretty much dismissed him as a suspect, saying that he simply wasn't smart enough to organise such a heist. He was a college dropout who was constantly drugged up or drunk. They just don't think he had the forethought to be able to do something like this. Which may be an offensive thing to say in any other scenario, but I can imagine Rick was quite happy with that here. He eventually got married and had kids, he works your very standard job, lives in a very standard house. Not exactly the kind of lifestyle you'd expect from somebody who sold priceless paintings. Rick was probably a bit of a bad security guard, they just didn't pay enough for him to care, but a criminal mastermind? Probably not. And that's about all I have for you with today's episode. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. What do you think is the most likely scenario here? Where do you think the paintings are? In a lot of cases, paintings stolen in heist tend to be recovered a generation on, with a generation considered to be like 20 to 30 years. It's now been almost 33 years, so chances are getting higher that the artwork could be recovered. As all the suspects in this case, the gangsters are gradually dying, the FBI hope that the intimidation will end and possible witnesses might come forward. The paintings have to be somewhere, the likelihood is they wouldn't have been destroyed. They just need to be found.
To this day, as per Isabella Gardner's request that no artwork be added or removed from the museum, the empty frames of all these stolen pieces remain on the walls of the museum as a reminder of the heist to anyone who enters, to ensure that the search never ends. Those involved in this case say that this isn't cold, new leads are coming in constantly, and I do get the impression the FBI have a pretty solid idea of what happened. They know who's involved, they just need to find the paintings. As the statute of limitations has now run out, no one can be arrested for this. They just want the paintings returned, these very important pieces of history. Anyone with any information about the artwork may contact the FBI or the museum directly or through a third party. You can also submit tips online and as always I'll leave all the contact details down below. Again, a huge thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring today, please make sure you check them out by also clicking on the link down below. You can get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.